I was saying to Pony just to keep playing there, it shortens the night, but welcome everyone to the evening service. Um, a special welcome to uh, William Hamilton, the Reverend William Hamilton, who will be speaking to us this evening. Just a very few uh, announcements, and there's a couple of folks from St. Brendan's. Brendan's I see as well. You're, you're particularly welcome. All right, girls. Um, you come here every week because I call you girls. That's even better. Just a couple of wee, couple of wee reminders from the announcements today. First of all, next Sunday service. Danny's speaking next Sunday um, in the morning, and as usual, PC's doing uh, on Thessalonians memory service. Am I right? And secondly, then we have the cafe church at half past six on on Sunday night outside there. The only other thing I think I need to remind some folks of, in case they weren't here today, was the full committee meeting on the 7th of November at half past seven. All the rest of the stuff is in this. If you got one this morning, you've got one. If you haven't, there's one or two still probably outside. Let's calm our hearts for a second or two and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come this evening into your nearer presence and worship you. Be with us as we sing, as we hear your word, and as we hear it expounded, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first uh, hymn then, folks, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Let's all stand to sing.
Let's all join together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together tonight in this place. <clears throat> You've reminded us in our first praise that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord, and we praise you for that. You gave your only son to die for each one of us that we, yet sinners, were able to be one again with you through that undeserved grace that you have given and still give. We thank you for all that you have done in each of our lives. We thank you that through the Holy Spirit we are continually blessed. Help us to remember both in the good times and the difficult times that you are still God, that you are still in control and that all things work to good for those who follow you. Thank you for the reminder this morning in our morning anniversary service that the purpose of the church is to evangelize and bring sin sinners to God. So through that saving faith, um, our partnership with the Holy Spirit. Help each one of us to play our part fully in the work here in Sydenham so that others may know of you. Through all the opportunities you give us, through your strength, help us to not be apologists but encourages to others who may be seeking. <coughs> Lord, we also think of this world and the difficulties and tragedies that we hear of regularly in the news or on TV or radio or through other social media. Lord, remind us that you are in control and nothing happens outside your purpose. We thank you for all who attended this morning and the encouragement they are to each one of us. Thank you for Danny and how he faithfully preaches the gospel here. Bless him in his work here for you in the relationships he builds and give him continued strength. For those who are ill, be close to them and surround them with your love and care. Your love is so deep and so wide to all. We claim your promises through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We we'll stand again, folks, to sing um, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Let's stand to sing.
Good evening, folks. Good evening. Can I just say that Donny didn't tell me it was going to be a youth service this evening? Uh, so can I expect you all at Tully Cornet next week then? If he said ladies and got a, a good response, I'm going to try and just milk it all together and include the men as well. But it is lovely uh, to be with you this evening and to share with you, as you've heard, I'm William Hamilton. I'm the minister of Tully Cornet Presbyterian, and it's nice to be here this evening to share with you. We're going to uh, read the scriptures together. Our scripture reading is found in the Old Testament in the book of Haggai, and we're going to read from chapter 1 and verse 12. Hopefully the reading's on the screen behind me. You probably know your Bible well enough to turn to it anyway, but if you don't, turn to the Old Testament, to the end of it, and move three books back, and you'll find yourself at Haggai. This is the word of the Lord. Then Serubabel, the son of Sheathiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Serubabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Serubabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Serubabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, <clears throat> yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. We end our reading there and we know that God will bless the public reading of his own inspired word. We're going to continue to worship as we sing together, Lord the light of your love is shining.
I do apologise if I uh, cough a time or two uh, this evening. I have a bit of a, a dry cough, and sometimes when they catch you, you can't get rid of it just as easy. So <coughs> apologies up front uh, if that happens to be the case. We're going to turn to those verses that we read together from the prophet Haggai. Haggai is a, a relatively unknown prophet, I suppose, in, in Scripture. If we were doing a, a, a Bible quiz or, or Bible trivia, there would be other names that would maybe spring to your mind rather than the prophet Haggai. Uh, we're not told much about him. We don't know his father's name. We're not told what tribe uh, he comes from. None of this information is given to us. Often, when you turn to some of the major prophets, we're given this background information about them. Haggai appears suddenly on the pages of Scripture. We find him mentioned in Ezra chapter 5, and we're told the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Idu. So Zechariah is mentioned, and his father, the son of Idu. But we're not told anything then about this character, Haggai. We do know that they both prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel. And I liked what one uh, scholar said about this background of Haggai. He said, he appears suddenly in all of the dignity of a heaven-appointed messenger with no credentials but that the word of the Lord was on his lips. And surely this evening as we gather for worship, that's the only credentials that is necessary. That it's the word of the Lord that we are met around this evening. Throughout uh, this book, there will be the refrain that the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai. Some versions will have came by the hand of Haggai. Uh, that just simply means that he was the human instrument that God used. You'll find it in one, verse 1. You'll find it again in verse 3. And you'll find various sort of different ways of communicating this, one in verse 5 and on into chapter 2, verses 1, 10, and 20. So if you haven't got the point by the time that you've read through these two short chapters, Haggai was God's messenger. And that makes it all the more remarkable when we consider verse 12 of chapter 1. You see, we are told in verse 12 that then after the word of the Lord had come through this character Haggai, we're told then, Serubabel the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua the son of Jehoshadak the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as, their, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. You see, the people understood that although Haggai was the one sent by God, the message that he proclaimed was not his message. And you and I need to constantly be reminded of this same truth. The word that we read, the word that we hear, the word that you have expounded to you week in and week out, it's not the word of Donnie Rankin. It's not the word of William Hamilton. It's not the word of any other person who will stand before you behind this lectern. If we are faithful messengers, it is the word of the Lord. And the people received it as such. They heard the word and they understood that this was from God. And so it's remarkable that even though there's very little told us about this character, Haggai, the people knew enough to know that he was a messenger of God and that the word that they were hearing was God's word and not his. We were singing earlier about, Lord, the light of your love is shining. And then we sang, send forth your word and let there be light. You see, God is a sending God. God, of course, is a missionary God. He sends his people. He sends his people to tell others the good news of the gospel. And Haggai was sent 
by God. But he was sent by God to God's own people. And he was sent to speak a word to them. And I would encourage you, read this short book for yourselves. Two short chapters. You could go home tonight and read it before you'd go to bed and you would have it uh, done and dusted before you get finished in a cup of tea or coffee. And yet the people realized that in these messages was a word from the Lord for them. Now the first word was a, a word of challenge. God told his people to consider their ways. He repeats throughout chapter 1, consider your ways. You see, the people thought that it wasn't time to build the house of the Lord. And if you look at the history of this passage, you can understand their logic. You see, to human eyes, it wasn't a good time. The economy was on a, a social downturn. Does that sound familiar? Things just didn't seem the right time to maybe step out on a great venture of faith. And so they were putting things on hold. And then they were a remnant. They were a small group of faithful, committed people to God. But they were a small group nonetheless. How often churches today think along this same lines. The time's not right. We're in the midst of an economic downturn. Of course, we are in the midst of that other word. you know that word Brexit? You probably haven't heard it. Do you need me to explain it to you? Or have you been living on Mars or Jupiter or something that you don't know? Brexit is the time's not right in our day. That's the, the, the fear factor, the unknown factor. What do we do in the midst of Brexit? Well, you see, the people in Haggai's day were saying, when you look around you and you see all these factors, the, the economic downturn, we're a small remnant. I mean, what can we do? There's only a few of us. Uh, when they were putting all this together, they were saying, the time's not right. And so God sends his messenger to tell them to consider their ways. And that's another thing, by the way, about being a messenger of God. Because it's not your word, you can't choose the message you give. If God sends you to tell his people, consider your ways, then that's the message you have to say. Uh, sometimes churches shoot, not literally, thank you, but shoot the messenger. You know, they, they, they get their hackles up when God's servant delivers a message that maybe they didn't want to hear. Maybe God says, consider your ways. And it can be unpopular. But he, guy, he came along, he was faithful to the word, and he proclaims this message. And you'll read it for yourself in chapter 1. We have joined the story in chapter 2. Because no sooner do the people receive the word of the Lord. Again, recognizing this was God's word. No sooner do the people receive the word of the Lord. And begin to build that God sends Haggai again. And this time God encourages them. God tells them not to be afraid. God tells them to be strong. God tells them to work, and God reminds them that he is the Lord Almighty. I wonder, did you pick up even in the verses that we read together that that refrain is driven home repeatedly? Thus says the Lord God Almighty. Be strong, says the Lord God Almighty. Build, says the Lord God Almighty. I mean, I'm slow, but even I get this message. God's saying that for him... Nothing is impossible. And so he wants to encourage these people. He, first of all, challenges them because they have a wrong mindset. You see, God's time is always the right time. And when God decides to build his church, it doesn't matter what condition the economy's in. It doesn't matter if you're starting off in Brexit and not sure what way things will go. Those things don't factor into it. If the Lord God Almighty tells his people to build, then his people should build. And the response of the people receiving God's word in obedience, God then stirs up their hearts to work on building the house of the Lord. And he encourages them in chapter 2 and verse 5 by telling them that God's spirit remains in the midst of his chosen people. There's lots of important little words in Haggai that's worth our consideration. Chosen, for example, is an important word in this book. We will read towards the end that God had 
chosen Zerubbabel as his signet ring. You'll read that in verse 23 of chapter 2. You also will have grasped by now that God had chosen Haggai as his spokesman because that's what the prophets were. They were God's spokesmen. But we're also told that God had chosen the remnant as his servants to build his house. Chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. That's a very important little word, remnant. So often today, small churches grow discouraged and downcast, and they say, if only we had more people, if only we had more money, if only we had more resources. That little word remnant reminds us that it was a small group of faithful people that returned to the land and returned to the call to build God's house. It's a a hugely important word. If you read the the story of Joseph, uh, we all know the story of Joseph from Sunday school days, even uh, right through till now. But there's a lovely little phrase towards the end where Joseph in chapter 45 is actually addressing his brothers. And he says to them, God sent me. There's this God who sends again. You can't get away from it. From Genesis to Revelation, God is a missionary God. He sends his people. And he says, God sent me before you to preserve a remnant on the earth. And then he says, so it was not you who sent me here, but it was God. And that tells me that God knows exactly where his people are. God has his people strategically placed. It's no coincidence that you are here. It's no coincidence that Donnie Rankin is your minister at this time. It's no coincidence that those people who are in leadership in your Kirk session or your congregational committee or whatever it may be throughout your church, God knows And God wants us to be encouraged that he knows that God is in control. Do you remember how God told Elijah, Elijah felt poor me. I'm the only one left who's faithful to the Lord. Uh, Again, he, he was in his equivalent of a Brexit. He was thinking, Lord, do you not see what's going on here? And of course, God reminds him that he had a faithful remnant of 7,000 people who had not bowed the knee to Baal. 1 Kings chapter 19. And the Apostle Paul takes that same incident and he writes this in Romans 11. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. A remnant chosen by grace. Every child of God is part of God's remnant chosen by God's grace. And there are people in our communities and in our city and in our land who will be part of God's remnant because of God's grace. And we, like the people of Haggai's day, need to realize that when we obey God's word, when we literally put into action God's word to us as a people, then when we do God's work in God's way, We will not lack God's power. And there's a lovely little phrase there where God reminds them that his spirit is in their midst. God says, I have covenanted this with you. Us Presbyterians are big into covenant theology. And it's good that we are. But you see, God has covenanted that his spirit will enable his people to build his kingdom. It was exactly the same in Haggai's day. It is no different when Paul was ministering to the church of God in Rome or in Corinth. And friends, it's no different today to you and I in East Belfast. Whether it's you here in Strand seeking to reach out to your community or me and my folks seeking to reach out to our community, God has covenanted that if we remain faithful to his word, to his ways, we can count on his power. And I want to tell you something tonight. This little book has blessed me greatly because the only resource we need tonight to build God's kingdom is God. And we need to realize that. And we need to stop making excuses. We need to stop 
beating ourselves up and saying, there's only a few of us, or we haven't enough of this, or haven't enough of that. If God is telling you and I to build his church, then we have all the resources we need. But God here speaks to the leaders. He speaks to those in leadership. And then he speaks to all the people. He speaks to the remnant. And you know what this is? This is the Old Testament equivalent of the church being a body of people. You see, your minister can't do it on his own. I can't do it on my own where God has placed me. We can't even do it with the help of a faithful Kirk Sison. We are all called to be involved in the building work because you have gifts and personalities that I don't have or that Danny doesn't have or that some of your elders don't have. We all have been uniquely gifted by God and we have a role, an important role to play in the church, in the body of Christ. Could it be that the reason the worldwide church is often perceived to be so powerless today is because we have lost sight of the fact that God's the only resource that we truly need? Or could it be that we're not as obedient to God's word as we like to think we are? You see, do you know what surprises me when I read the likes of Haggai or Isaiah or Jeremiah or any of the great prophets of God? The people actually didn't realize that they were straying from God's word and God's ways. In fact, God has to say to them here, consider your ways. And if you read Isaiah, you'll see exactly the same thing. The people will say, how come we're we're fasting and, uh, and it doesn't seem to have any good? And God said, is this the fast I require? And, and we sometimes can, can be derailed. We can be sidetracked from the task that God has called us to. And it's not a deliberate or an intentional thing, but it happens. And God often has to call us back to his blueprint, to his word. And if we aren't building according to this word, we can't claim the resources that God offers us. But when we're sure, when we're confident that we're building according to God's word, then we have all the resources that we need. And God's appointed time is always the right time, even when the human eye would tell us that that's not the case. The word of the Lord came through his servant. First of all, it challenges them, consider your ways. But then once they consider their ways and return to God's word, to doing what God has called them to do, God promises to be with them. That's his presence. God promises his spirit is in their midst. That's his powerful presence. And he says, thus says the Lord God Almighty. That's the only authority God's people need. The Lord God Almighty. But it's how we receive this word. Do we receive it the same way that the people in Haggai's time received it? Do we receive it like the church in Thessalonica? Paul writes to them and he says, We thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Paul says, Do you know why there's a church in Thessalonica today? It's because you realized this is God's word, not mine. And we need to realize that each time God's word's proclaimed to us, it's God speaking. Each time you open your devotional book and read it, it's God speaking. Each time you attend a Bible study or lift God's word, it's God's word. It's not the word of man though God often uses human instruments like Haggai or Paul or or ordinary people like you and I. You see, the believers in Haggai's day and in Paul's day received the message from God's messengers as it truly is, the word of God. Surely today, you and I, living after Pentecost, living with the indwelling of God's Spirit. 
living in light of the Great Commission, where God promises that we are to go into all the world and tell them about Jesus Christ. But God promises to be with us even to the end of the age. That's the New Testament equivalent of what Haggai was talking of in the Old. When you do what God says in his word, God promises to be with you, and God will send his Holy Spirit to empower you. The church is living in the same age. I know you're celebrating uh, an anniversary, or actually two anniversaries, I suppose there's been the opening of uh, this building, but you're also celebrating a long history of this church. I don't think there's, correct me if I'm wrong, and Penny's a compliment here again, by the way, I don't think there's anyone here who remembers the first building, maybe when it was first put up. Uh, and if you do, you're looking powerful well. <laughs> but the principle that Haggai was saying here is this. Churches sometimes say, do you remember when this place was full? Do you remember when this place was bursting at the seams? Ah, but those were different days. It's not like that now. You just can't get the people in. People aren't interested anymore. Different days now. Do you know what God said to Haggai? You tell these people that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. You tell these people, if you think that was good, you want to see what I'll do if you obey my word. God says the glory of this former house will be greater than that, that there. He says it'll be greater. It'll be mind-blowing. And you know something? When Jesus Christ walked this earth, his feet trod the temple grounds that Haggai and this small remnant had a part in in rebuilding and keeping going. And friends, tonight, we have all the promises of God and Christ. This same Jesus hasn't lost any of his power to save. There's people in your community and mine. There's people in our family circles who are strangers to God's grace. But God hasn't changed. And we need to get back to trusting solely in the promises and in the power of God. How do we receive the preaching of God's word each week that we hear it? Does it enthuse us? Does it inspire us? Does it challenge us to be the people of God he wants us to be in our own generation? Do we receive it like the people of Thessalonica did? We could all do well to heed Paul's advice about the noble Bereans. They searched the scriptures to see if it was so. Would I tell you tonight, don't take William Hamilton's word for it. Go home and read this book, Haggai. And if I've said anything here tonight that's not in that book, you dismiss it. But you see, if I've said what's in this book and you dismiss it, you dismiss it at your own cost. I can tell you now, I believe God wants to do as great a work in our day as he did in Haggai's or Paul's. But we need to get back to God's word. We need to get back to God's ways. And we need to get back to trusting in the greatest resource that we have. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. But it's only when we are obedient. Acts 5 says it's only when the church is obedient that God pours his spirit out this way. The good news for you and I is we have a promise from God that God will build his church. And that promise is for you here in Strand, for me and Tully Carnot, and we need to lay hold of the promises of God because he has promised to be with us as we seek to implement what he's told us to do. And I hope that God gives us the grace and the wisdom to be men and women of the book who will not only read it, but who will implement it, put it into action. And let me encourage you, stand with your minister Stand with your Kirk Sison. Stand with those in leadership and seek to build according to the word of God. And you just might be surprised at the glory of God in this place.
because I'm hoping and expecting to be surprised at the glory of God where he has placed me. May God bless you as you celebrate your anniversary and may he encourage you to be found much in his word and walking in his ways. We're going to sing with a very opt closing hymn, Great is thy faithfulness. I go on to remind us that God doesn't change. God changes not. The God who spoke through Haggai, the God who spoke through the prophets in these last days has spoken to us through one greater than them. He has spoken to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. And God's Spirit is as powerful in East Belfast as he was in Jerusalem or Thessalonica. Let's praise God for his faithfulness. Father God, we thank you that your word reminds us that not only is your faithfulness great, but in your faithfulness to us, you provide all that we need. We thank you that you always provide for yourself a remnant of grace. We thank you for the the history of our church, of our denomination. We remember the work here in Strand and my own work with my folk in Tully Carnot. We pray for the part of the vineyard that you've called us to. We pray for East Belfast, Lord, that you would be pleased in these days to make us people of your word. 
And we pray that as we seek to implement these glorious truths, that we will know a fresh anointing of your Spirit's power. And as we return on to you with these offerings this evening, we acknowledge, O God, just as you have said through Haggai, your prophet, that the silver and the gold is already yours. The cattle on a thousand hills are yours. And yet through simple acts of obedience, through coming and sharing of all that you have blessed us with through our tithes and offerings, we can practically contribute to the building of your kingdom here in our city. And so I pray for your servant, Danny, for those who labor with him in Kirk Session and Congregational Committee, those who are involved in nefarious organizations, that they might be encouraged in these days to be strong and to work, that the glory of Jesus, the risen Lord, might fill this place, and that you may draw throughout our city people to yourself, both here in Tully Cornet, throughout the north and south, that the Presbyterian Church in Ireland may know the mighty power of your Holy Spirit. As we go from your house, may we do so with your blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.